Good morning, everyone. My name's Ken Peppel. I'm a CTO with Selenia, and I'll be our moderator today uh, for our panel. Everything got very bright. Um, today, we're going to be talking um, an OpenStack panel here with analysts, both from the region and worldwide. And we'll be getting their feedback on OpenStack from their point of view. Uh, from left to right, I have Matthew Chung from Gartner. Next to him is Agatha Poon from 451 Research. Next to her is Asumi Miki uh, at at sign IT. Next to uh, Miki-san is Sean Michael Kerner from eWeek. And then finally, um, Frederic Lardenois from TechCrunch. Um, so uh, we'll have a um, short number of predefined questions uh, we'll be getting their opinions on. And then at the end, uh, we'll open it up from questions for the audience. So to get started, um, our first question is, OpenStack is big in Asia. Why? And I'll start with ladies first with Agatha. All right. Testing. Okay. So, um, yeah, because um, part of my core coverage is Asia Pacific, so I'm very, you know, exciting to talk about Asia. So OpenStack, why is big in Asia? I think uh, the, the short answer or more generic answer is number one, uh, typically people think about Asia is, you know, there's very diverse, a lot of pocket of opportunities and, you know, infrastructures is quite different, you know, from country to countries. So, but there's still a lot of um, sort of like uh, not too much legacy infrastructures. So when you are under that environment, it's just much easier to, you know, to adopt, you know, new technologies, new infrastructures. So that's one reason. And the other reason is, uh, if you look at, you know, Asia in general, especially a lot of emerging market, you see a lot of uh, young talent. So young talents are much easier to uh, be open-minded and to, you know, kind of evaluate different options and technologies. So that's also helped to really, you know, drive the, uh, the interest in adoptions of OpenStack in Asia Pacific. And I think uh, last but not least, uh, what I see is um, in Asia, we do have a very large uh, user base and uh, for the use of OpenStack. So when you have technologies and, and, and new infrastructures, idea model like that, you need a very vibrant and robust ecosystem to really drive you know, the technologies moving forward. So that's you know, probably what I think is the reason why we see a lot of excitement and adoption and trial and POC and even production you know, uh, uh, implementation in Asia Pacific. Great. Yep. Okay. I, I really resonate what uh, Agatha said, said about uh, uh, young people. Um, you know, um, I think that a whole uh, movement around uh, cloud is really sort of uh, transforming the landscape of Japanese IT. But uh, what's, what's notable with OpenStack is really that it uh, really gives opportunity to, for a, a younger younger IT engineers to really uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, get their ability sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of appeal to uh, uh, the, the world, actually. Um, you know, IT industry in Japan has been uh, um, considered a very sort of um, uh, good, vibrant, industry, but at the same time, IT industries, IT engineers' jobs have been uh, generally considered uh, dirty work. I mean, you know, requiring a lot of uh, long hours of work, um, sleepless, sleepless nights, uh, changing customers' requirements, um, you know, um, uh, lower salary than, uh, than, than the job they're doing. So it's kind of a suffocating uh, uh, work environment for many uh, IT engineers in Japan. But, but OpenStack really gives the, the opportunity for them to really sort of get liberated and uh, express themselves uh, in various ways. Excellent. Matthew? Uh, yes, I 
I come from uh, Singapore, so uh, I represent Asia Pacific, I think. And um, yeah, when I look at you know open source general, you know open source uh, initiative across Asia Pacific, and then I I can see you know the actually the open source uh, penetration is uh, quite high uh, when compared to you know other parts of the world in Asia Pacific. So when you look at you know that kind of penetrations, why this is happening in Asia Pacific, especially because these governments, you know uh, the Chinese governments, the Indian governments, you know they are they are putting a lot of resources, investments in open source development. And one of the key concerns is the national security here, because you know, open source being more you know, open and then being more you know, transparent in terms of the source codes. So um, government can look into the you know, source codes and then they know, you know whether there will be you know, any backdoor or you know, those kind of things. And then this is you know, high level trends, right? But for OpenStack specifically, I think it is more to deal with uh, the digital transformation uh, in the region. And we can see actually you know, uh, the, the, the uh, enterprises, traditional enterprises, they need to transform from you know, traditional, you know, maybe you know, some verticals, but they need to transform into e-commerce or you know, a digital business. They can you know, combine with IoT technologies to do some new business. And OpenStack actually give them a very good uh, platform to develop their capabilities. So I think that is the key for, you know, for OpenStack, or OpenStack uh, adoption. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I'll just give a couple quick points and then we'll go to the next. Uh, historically, uh, Japan and the Asia Pac has always been a very strong Linux base. Uh, I've been writing on Linux for a long time and Japan was always, when my stories were translated in Japanese, that was always uh, exciting for me since I don't read very well. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, so OpenStack and cloud specifically, but more OpenStack is a natural evolution from Linux. Uh, because all OpenStack clouds run on Linux, except for the two or three that run on Solaris, but we won't <laughs> talk about those. Uh, and then the other obvious thing is uh, space and density, which is what cloud is about. Uh, in North America, there's probably a little bit more space, or maybe not, I don't know. I'm in Canada, so we're mostly open space. So if we're not gonna build a hockey rink, we're gonna build a data center. Uh, <laughs> In other places, you want to get as much as you can out of every piece of uh, every square foot and cloud, specifically OpenStack now. And then when we talk about containers, which I know is a future question here, uh, the density question is answered. And that's why it's popular uh, in Asia and around the world. Great. All right, I'm in Oregon, where we also have a lot of space for data centers, apparently. So maybe density is not an issue there. Um, obviously, I know very, very little about the Asia Pacific market, but I've talked to a few people, including, I think, your CEO. And I may just kick this back to you guys over there because one of the opinions I've heard there is that, um, especially in Japan, the adoption is somewhat behind the US by a year or two because there's been some resistance to open source to some degree. It's, it's an opinion I've been hearing and maybe one of you can, can take that. Um, I don't think that th there's a resistance to open source per se. Uh, it's really that many uh, organizations are not uh, accustomed to uh, open source. But nevertheless, uh, as uh, he said, uh, there are uh, lots and lots of uh, Linux adopters um, in Japan, in uh, typical enterprises. So uh, it's really not the, the uh, uh, resistance to open source. It's really uh, finding the right uh, use cases for them. You know, uh, uh, the typical Japanese organizations tend to be uh, smaller in uh, uh, sizes uh, in IT. Well, knowing that OpenStack uh, really sort of uh, shines when uh, you deploy it in a large environment, well, you know, uh, many people are uh, seriously sort of searching for a good uh, way to exploit the power of, uh, of OpenStack. Excellent. So, Frederick, do you feel that OpenStack has hit the tipping point yet? It's a, it's a tough question, right? But um, I feel we're getting there. I've, I've been in this business for about a year now since the Paris summit. And I've seen quite a shift from massive skepticism just a year ago to real user use cases and real production use cases in the last year, 
which is something we just didn't see a year ago. So I feel we're close to the tipping point. I'm not sure we're at the tipping point, but I think we're quite, quite close. I'll, I'll split the question into two parts. On the public cloud, not even close, not by a long shot, not for years, maybe ever. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, Amazon's margins are uh, ridiculously thin. Uh, they have a CEO that doesn't care about margins, and they can outprice and outcompete anyone on the planet, period, full stop. No, no, they have 25% of margin, operating margin. And, and they can grow, but he can squeeze it down. So he's had slow margins and he's had wide margins, but he doesn't care because he doesn't, right. so he doesn't, when people ask him about margins, on, you've been on the same calls I have probably, he doesn't care, right? So, but it can grow and it can contract. That's why they keep doing the price cuts. Uh, if, but regardless, so on the public, that's fine, and then people keep getting out of the public. On the private, uh, it's actually really a simple question because uh, I'll, I'll ask the question to the audience. Aside from OpenStack, what other private cloud solution is there? Right? So it's a foregone conclusion at this point because OpenStack is all things to all people. It's an integration platform where everyone plugs into it. VMware, which should be the natural organic competitor, nope. Uh, they plug in, they have VMware integrated OpenStack. Eucalyptus, where are they? Gone, history. CloudStack, where are they? Gone, history. Who else is left? Azure, that's only uh, uh, mostly public, uh, private, kind of, sort of, maybe. So on the uh, private side, it's not even a question of tipping point. There is nothing else. On public, uh, will somebody rise up to challenge Amazon in that space? Does somebody need to? Don't know. Uh, that's a question that will be answered in years to come. Great. Matthew, what do you feel? Yeah, um, I feel similar to that, but uh, I would divide the market into you know operators or service providers uh, space and also you know enterprise. But I think you know for operators, I think they, it, it is at the tipping points right now because they can you know make use of that, and you can see a lot of examples here in the conference. But not the enterprise. I would say you know still uh, enterprise need some pain points, you know, some use case uh, to develop, you know, uh, to use uh, OpenStack, you know, in their infrastructure. So that there are quite a big gaps in that area. Great. Agatha? So uh, given the fact that we already look at it from different angle, right, private, uh, public, and then <laughs> from service providers and, and, and enterprises, maybe I look at it from a, a geographical standpoint, right? <laughs> So, um, so if you look at the region, or, or um, even like overall global market, we do have like forecast to really tracking the size of the market, and um, we are really getting close to the tipping point. Not yet. I mean, I, I think probably you would expect to see uh, a, a very you know high uh, adoption and, and growth in the next you know 12, 18 months, but not you no, know, we are not, we are not yet. Um, but I think the that we are get heading to that what we call the tipping point. That's you know global market. If you look at Asia again, you know is is really very diverse. Uh, some market I would say is probably hit the you know tipping point. Especially if we look at even like emerging market like China. I mean the, there's a second largest you know user group, and there's lots of the really actual implementation uh, within the service providers and even a state-owned company in China and uh, lots of the providers not just service providers but also you know software distributions and you know cloud management and all, all different players come into place to create a very uh, vibrant um, ecosystem so in, in that sense that's hits the tipping point but of course there's also the other side of the story or or, or, or other market is still really working on you know um, try to figure out what's the best way to approach the, these technologies and whether they can integrate or to collaborate. Um, so um, it, it, it really depends on you know, which market that we are talking about, I mean, in, in geographical sense. Miki-san, how do you feel yeah. this is in Japan? Well, um, I, I feel that we need more sort of uh, strong message from OpenStack community that OpenStack embraces um, second platform applications, for example. Um, in, a, in the marketplace, I, can, I, I talk to uh, several uh, ecosystem uh, vendors who are concentrating on uh, uh, enterprise use cases, and uh, they're, uh, for example, offering a storage platform that can sort of integrate uh, OpenStack environment and uh, uh, VMware environment. So, uh, you know, uh, 
So the products and services that would help enterprise adoption uh, of OpenStack is growing. So it, it really, really needs sort of uh, promoting, you know, letting the world know that, uh, uh, especially in Japan, letting the people know that there are solutions that are uh, suitable for typical Japanese enterprises. You know, that's, that's where uh, we are seriously sort of lacking in uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, we are seriously uh, trying to find uh, use cases. I mean, a lot of people are, are, are looking for replacement of uh, VMware. You know, uh, OpenStack can serve that purpose. Why deny it? Excellent. Well, thank you for that. So I think I'll take a little bit of a, a different tack here since we were talking about where OpenStack was going and how it perhaps edged out the competition in the private cloud. Over the last few years, OpenStack was kind of the darling of the open source and kind of IT. But within the last year, Docker, Kubernetes, Coros, and a bunch of the other container technologies have really come out and shown a lot of momentum in the market. So a lot of the people out there have said, well, the future's Docker, and Docker will make OpenStack irrelevant. Other people have said, no, the cloud will be there for many years. I think other people have probably said they'll, they'll coexist. What are your feelings on the topic? We'll start down here. I'm probably one of the people who also assumed that Docker may be just taking over, and, and um, maybe a year ago I would have said that. Looking at OpenStack more and, and the use cases I'm seeing from the companies I'm talking to, I feel there is still quite, the, the whole point of the integration engine, right? That's, that's, that's something that keeps coming up and I feel that's really where OpenStack outshines all of those other use cases because there's so many companies that can move to OpenStack without completely redesigning everything they're doing. If you're going to containers and, and you're going to use Kubernetes and everything else, you're just going to have to re-architect everything. So if you're starting over or you're starting new, I think you, know, you probably don't need OpenStack at that point. You can, you can run your stuff on containers and microservices and you'll be just fine. You don't need the whole complexity of OpenStack at that point. Um, so I think they'll just coexist quite happily for a long time. Um, in, yeah, <laughs> it's technology. There's no point in talking about a 10-year or 20-year horizon, really. But I would, I would think within 10 years it's, it's going to be a different discussion because people will have adopted containers far more than they have today. Yeah, see, for me, it's not even a coexistence. It's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, that's an interesting word, right? Uh, there's this wonderful project that I'm learning about this week called Project Cola. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Project Cola, it's the ability to, dis to deploy OpenStack in a container. So it's a chicken and egg. And the Oracle guys, uh, they jumped the gun a little bit on this. But Oracle, OpenStack, Linux, too, if there's any Oracle people and I got the wrong trademark, I apologize. The way you deploy that is as a set of Docker containers. So it's not even a question of coexistence. OpenStack is a container. Woo, that's crazy, right? So that's how it works because you have to think of containers as a deployment packaging format. And then it's also, you can think of it just as container as a micro virtualization segment. So as a packaging format, it answers a very difficult question that script kiddies like me have trouble with because uh, RPM is a pain in the butt and it breaks. Um, Docker, to push Docker and deploy an image is a Docker, deploy an OpenStack cloud, deploy uh, an individual service is um, easy. A uh, 10-year-old can do it, apparently. Uh, so that's where that's going to work. And then I'm also a big fan of history. Uh, in the IT industry, we had the same argument about 20 years ago with Java, because Java first ran bare metal. And then uh, BEA and WebLogic, if you remember these companies, and JBoss, all these, oh, well, we need higher levels of services and middleware, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Java never kind of went away. You have middleware, you have both. It's just the 50 cents one way or half a buck another, and both work and they exist together. It's not an either or and never will be. Thank you. Miki san? So, so the word uh, that uh, OpenStack is an integration engine, that, that, uh, that's going to work for a long time, I think. You know, not all applications are going to be, you know, a cloud native and microservices and, you know, Docker and uh, containers um, tomorrow. 
So uh, we, <laughs> we a, a lot of organizations will need um, uh, infrastructure that can uh, integrate all these different services, um, different layers and different uh, uh, types of services and run it uh, in a cohesive manner, in, in an automated way. So that's where uh, OpenStack shines, and it will uh, shine for a long time for that. Agatha? OK, so for me, um, I, I would agree the, the more integrated approach. Uh, and, and if you look at uh, the existing use case and even you know the conversation with service providers, it seems like um, it's, it's going to be coexist for when we say long time, you know, as you, as as you know, our our panel already talked about long time is is very tricky, right? Especially in the technology field. So I would say, like, at least in the next five years, we will see them coexist, you know, happily. Yeah, I do agree because uh, it takes VMware from you know two thousand three to now and get to the points like eighty percent of virtualizations, you know, in the in the markets. I think. It will take really long time for a container to have that kind of, you know, uh, infrastructure exposure, and also I would see, uh, you know, for uh, I, I certainly agree they will coexist, especially you know in different situation. Today we cannot put a database, Oracle database, into a container, right? So they have like you know you you put database in bare metal or you in in a VM, and then you know container can work with that database, you know, very. Well, I mean, so I think that kind of situation architecture will be, you know, will last for like, you know, another 10 years. Okay. Staying with you, since we're, you are a gardener and things. Yep. So the question is, we always ask on every one of these summits, is OpenStack Enterprise ready? What's your feeling today? Yeah, as uh, you know, the first question uh, came along and then I, I was saying, you know, it's not quite ready, you know, because for Gartner, you know, basically our clients are enterprise clients. And then um, I think the concerns would be around uh, security and then because the, we don't see a lot of security solutions built around, you know, OpenStack. And then certainly we see, you know, there are some something coming up. And then uh, also, you know, we see difference of delivery model in the in the uh, enterprise markets because uh, as OpenStack Foundation has uh, pushed the uh, certifications uh, today, you know, OpenStack administrator certification. So I think you know that is a good move. But still, um, for enterprise, they are short of uh, expertise and you know talents uh, within the organization. So they are difficult. Uh, they have difficulties in, you know, deploying uh, OpenStack. So in that case, I think, you know, it takes some time for, for them to, you know, grow their own expertise. And also, um, I would say, you know, uh, the managed kind of uh, 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 private cloud by, uh, with OpenStack, that, that kind of, you know, delivery model will be, you know, suitable for enterprise adoptions in the market. Okay. Agatha? So I, I would look at it as like, Almost like breaking two questions, like is enterprise, you know, themselves, <laughs> are enterprise themselves ready? And then is OpenStack technologies as a technology ready, right? So um, I think uh, if you look at OpenStack and now you see a lot of different um, contributions and different sort of like, you know, startup and, and, and new company coming in with all the plugin and the proprietary control plane and, you know, the, the orchestration. So if you look at the, the trends like that, it's obviously there's things to improve. That's why you see all these proprietary technologies coming to, to go hand in hand with OpenStack. So in that sense, it's, the technology is not ready yet. And now if you look at enterprise, also, I mean, you look at the adoption trends, and it, it, we already say, you know, even look at a uh, company that take a long time to virtualize their, their um, internal IT environment. Even right now, I think uh, in our survey indicate that most of the enterprise, you know, IT, probably maybe 67% of the environment is virtualized. And they are getting to the state to automation and not even get to orchestrations. So if in that case, we look at the, you know, sort of like the, imp uh, the, the transition, and it's gonna take a little long time for them to be ready to, you know, fully embrace uh, new technologies like OpenStack. So the, the the you know we cannot talk about enterprise as one entity entity right 
I mean, there are many, many types of organizations, uh, enterprises uh, with uh, different sizes, and, and they have different needs, uh, different uh, uh, way to consume IT. So uh, I, I would say OpenStack needs to offer a, a different uh, way to consume OpenStack te technology uh, to different people. If if um, majority of organization will uh, can, if it comes a time when uh, uh, a lot a lot of organizations can safely find uh, the solutions that suited for them to consume uh, OpenStack technology, that would uh, be the time when I can call um, OpenStack Enterprise ready. Sean, yeah, and I'll be quick because I, I see there are questions Sorry. from uh, from persons. Uh, my, my standard my standard joke whenever anybody says is you know something ready for the enterprise I say well you have to ask Captain Kirk it's his ship not mine right no jokes no Star Trek fans that's unreal uh, that's okay that that works in other cities but um, yeah I, I I know I know I know I know um, I, with uh, the larger question and I guess I kind of hit on it too is whether the enterprise is ready or not there, I shift that question and I ask people is do you actually need a cloud. Because what's the difference between cloud and just virtualization? It's metering, a uh, service-based approach, uh, and then a little bit more uh, disaggregation. Uh, and then sometimes some scaling and some additional manageability. So it's usually just a question of if that's needed. And I think for uh, small, medium-sized organizations, certainly, which make up a good portion of enterprises globally, uh, probably not. Uh, once you reach a certain scale, then you need it. So once you decide that a cloud who was ever cloud, it makes sense. Let's call it OpenStack, makes sense. Certainly OpenStack is, is, is capable, but the, the better question to ask is, do you need a cloud? Sure. Do you want to hackle us first, or should I? Sorry, Sorry you guys. Okay. <laughs> Robert said I was allowed to ask a question. So um, you guys are actually dealing with enterprise customers. Isn't the question not, is OpenStack ready, but rather is OpenStack what was promised when it first came about five years ago because what OpenStack was promised five years ago and what OpenStack is today is very different and witness the rise of Miranda. So, I mean, OpenStack was promised to be this amazing thing that you'd just, you'd, you'd plug and play and it would just go and all of a sudden you'd be like AWS and it would be unicorns and rainbows and you've got a company like Mirantis that is growing hugely and doing amazingly well precisely because OpenStack isn't that easy. So. Really the question is, does open, do you guys who actually talk to enterprises all the time believe that OpenStack knows what it is, and more importantly, that the customers actually know and understand what OpenStack is trying to be? Yes, uh, we're certainly aware of uh, Mirantis' uh, success in the markets, but uh, as I said, you know, there you see huge skill gap you know, in the markets, so why Mirantis or you know other providers are successful. Basically, they are providing services on top of OpenStack. So we think that OpenStack is more like a services market. So you know people can do uh, consulting, you know uh, system integrations for their customers for enterprise, so that you know they don't need to grow their own you know expertise in their market. So that's why I would think you know it's more to deal with uh, the delivery model, you know, business models, how you monetize OpenStack in different forms, yeah. So uh, I would look at it as like awareness. If you talk about enterprise awareness, you know, around OpenStack, it's there because it's a lot of, you know, maybe you can say it's like hype, you know, and, and it's a lot of, you know, talking and, and it's really under the industry spotlight. Um, the awareness is there, the interest is there, but I think that, that there's a gap, you know, between, you know, actual, you know, understanding and implement it and you know embrace it in your own environment we talked about earlier about your use case that i think is a very valid point you know do you have the use case to really use that type of you know sort of like open environment you know scale out type infrastructure i mean who's going to benefit of that and and what type of you know workload or application you're going to be running in that environment number one number two is also um the scap of the skill you know we're talking about even like for service providers i mean the biggest problem or challenge for them is really find the right talent to 
understand the technologies and be able to implement it. So um, I think that's the gap, you know, for enterprise to to fulfill. I mean, they can go to you know service providers to to get all the help, but still, I mean, especially for company that they already have their own IT, they certainly want to have you know certain extent of control themselves. But isn't that the problem? Because meanwhile, we're talking about this. They're spinning up AWS and enabling their developers to do whatever. So we're talking about this science experiment mm -hmm. that requires this whole service layer. We had, you know, name your big legacy vendor that's got a three letter or two letter name, acronym for a name, thought, awesome, there's some services revenue we can make here. But that's not actually what enterprise want. What enterprise want is to be able to enable people to actually deliver outcomes, and that's what AWS is giving them. Isn't that what Red Hat did with Linux? So who's the who's the equivalent? What's I don't the equivalent? know, but I mean, you, you're, you're, I don't know, sorry. It just, in early technologies, people make promises. People say things, they get excited about it. And then real companies have to come in and deliver something that companies can consume. I, I just don't think, it's not without precedent. The only thing I'd say is when I first started talking to people like you did, OpenStack, uh, some people will tell me, OpenStack is all things to all people. Whatever you want it to be, that's what it is. Uh, and then different vendors have different views. So it just depends on who you talk to, right? Uh, our three-letter friends uh, who have blue logos and uh, <laughs> other things uh, and many patents. Um, yeah, so they have a, they, they want it managed because they tell me and they t tell customers the same thing. It's too hard, so we'll just manage the whole thing for you and that's it. Uh, the other way around is Amazon, right? Because Werner Vogels, you've seen him, he always says, I used to hug servers, I don't want to hug them anymore. So it's, it's a question, do you want to hug your server or not? Some people like hugging servers, some don't. It's kind of hard usually to hug. It's really comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess what it comes down to to some degree is how hard it still is to stand up an OpenStack cloud at this point, right? That's really what it's all about. And it's that's where all these services come in, all these startups who just try to help you stand up your cloud. And as long as it's that hard to get going, the only people who can do it are the really big enterprises. The, the small, medium businesses are just not capable of doing it. And it's going to be really costly if they have to hire lots of consultants to do it. So I think that was the promise and that promised land of just being able to maybe a, just stand up a container with OpenStack at some point is going to make a big difference there. I'll just add in, because uh, I know there's some Red Hat people here. Uh, not that I don't like Marantis, because Marantis is great. And so is Susie. <laughs> they were all great. But uh, the first son of it I went to was in San Diego, and uh, there was an RDO session, and I sat in there, and I had RDO up and running in like 15, 20 minutes, and this is three years ago. So, you know, just a little bit of effort you can. And then this morning we heard NTT saying they're running 100 million users on RDO. So, Sorry, I want to add something because I don't want to paint a picture so pessimistic, right? Because it seems like I, I spoke, uh, yeah, speak for, you know, enterprise. But actually, you know, in some cases, especially when we see some enterprise, as I said, you know, in, in the journey of uh, digital transformation, and then uh, if they want to build some capabilities that is critical to their organization, you look at, you know, Walmart, you, know, you look at, you know, eBay, if e-commerce is at the core of their business, they need to grow their own capabilities, then they use OpenStack. But for general enterprises, medium, small size, I think they, they need to seek for other delivery model. Yeah, that, that's why uh, the world needs more OpenStack-based, uh, well-packaged uh, cloud services, public cloud services uh, that's approachable to uh, medium and small size uh, companies. Great. Are there any other questions? Thank you. I think one of the reasons why Linux became quite popular is the licensing they use, which is a general public license. And OpenStack, CloudStack, both use Apache license, which allows uh, to make the closed source software, if my understanding is correct. And I wonder, uh, on the Apache software license, how do you see the open source version of the multiple closed source version of the component uh, OpenStack itself? Personally, I think it's a huge problem. And when uh, the foundation and early on, uh, 
when I spoke with Chris Kemp, uh, who was the CTO at NASA, and uh, he had a very long discussion inside NASA when they were trying to decide what the licenses should be. GPL, there's a lot of people, I, I personally love the GPL, Richard Stallman is my father and that's great, okay? But, but widely used license. Absolutely, and it's fantastic, but a lot of commercial enterprises are afraid of GPL license infection, that is. So if you contribute code, then that code has to always be available and reciprocal, etc. It's a reciprocal license where Apache is not reciprocal. So if you give, you got to give back. Uh, so there is a risk, a non-trivial risk, that's never happened, where somebody could kind of split off and not give back. Uh, but the idea is so that it's more commercial friendly, because if you need that extra little piece to go on, there used to be this argument years ago about uh, uh, open core. Uh, and Apache can enable an open core. I think it does in limited sense, so that's why there can be a risk of interoperability, but that's why this idea of def core is kind of important. Is there a risk medium term? Maybe. Has there ever been a real problem, though, with uh, the Apache license? Let's say there's Apache HTTPD, right? The world's most popular web server. Uh, has that ever been a problem? No. Uh, with Hadoop, has it ever been a problem? Kind of, sort of, yes, because Cloudera, Hortonworks, are they the same? Not really. So in that example, if OpenStack goes down that direction, the infrastructure layers would be different, but you've got to remember people move workloads, not infrastructure, so the workloads would move across. So long story short, yeah, there's a risk of forks and little minor pieces, and yes, I think it should have been GPL, but at this point, it'll never happen. Other thoughts on licensing? Are there any other questions? Oh. Uh, so uh, I looked on the OpenStack.org uh, website and saw 27 uh, distributions of OpenStack. Uh, not asking uh, to name names, but more numbers. Five years from now, how many distros? 270. <laughs> Why not? There's, there, there's no barrier to entry. Um, I have a, a different opinion. I think uh, the, the distribution will be shrinking because we see some MMA you know, in the markets. Yeah. I would say, you know, just... Extending on from that question, not only are there lots of dis different distributions, but there's all the, the different projects within OpenStack that are, that are people, going, people are going down. Obviously, there was the past thing that I was kind of critical of a, a year or two ago, and, and container is the new flavor of the day. Again, for you guys that are actually talking to enterprises, it's very simple to tell people well, this is a tool with which you can buy, build yourself an Amazon-like or AWS-like private cloud. All of a sudden, it's very difficult to tell a story about what OpenStack is because it's PaaS and it's NFE and it's SDN and it's cloud and it's container and it's this and it's that. What do you guys want to see in terms of more focus from the foundation or from the project in terms of what it is? Well, um, traditionally, I talk to infrastructure and operation folks, so you know they get that you know how that works for them. But now, OpenStack, you know, I mean, you know, um, increasing, you know, adding some uh, new projects. I think you know that actually positioned them as uh, you know different story than you know traditional IaaS kind of storyline. So. Uh, application developments, you know, and also, you know, network administrator, they will be paying attention to that. I think that increased the target audience, I would say, and also, you know, different, actually, you know, uh, in the foundation, I think they tend to uh, let different group of people implement different projects, so they don't necessarily tie up to, you know, the whole OpenStack kind of implementation, so I think that is a good thing, so that, you know, different project can target different people uh, yeah, in long run. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, especially when you look at enterprise, um, it also depends on, if you look at right now, a lot of the, you know, sort of like uh, project or component, subcomponent coming out, and, and it seems they like really try to address all the challenges um, enterprise facing, you know, like role-based access, identity, 
um, you know, metering, even metering is may maybe not necessary, but we are ho talking about the whole concept of delivering IT as a service. If you look at enterprise themselves as a service provider, then, you know, that might be helpful. I mean, not necessarily they're going to charge back to the internal employee, but you can at least show them, you know, the usage and all these things. So if you look at all this sub project, um, that's kind of in line with, you know, what they try to achieve and address, you know, the, the concern around, um, you know, whether, you know, we earlier talked about whether it's enterprise ready or what are the challenges enterprise facing in order to, to really get over that hurdle and, and, and to, you know, reach the next level of growth or adoption. So, so uh, OpenStack is technology and AWS is obviously um, a service. So it's, uh, it, there's a complete difference uh, between them, but uh, I, I think uh, uh, from uh, my interview with o OpenStack Foundation uh, board pe uh, members and you know uh, Jonathan and Mark, S so uh, what they are uh, really trying to do is really as technology, uh, they are um, trying to still trying to uh, battle with AWS. Well, with uh, their, uh, AWS is providing uh, the technology as service. But uh, OpenStack Foundation is really uh, look, uh, trying to build technology that uh, uh, service provider can build on to uh, offer services. Yeah, see for me, I see the OpenStack Foundation as a framework. They don't build anything. Uh, they just facilitate collaboration. So the, to say, you know, what area should the OpenStack Foundation focus? I think their focus is exactly where it should be, uh, users, right? Uh, and the user, just like the customer in business, is always right. I'll twist that around for a little bit as, because I don't talk to the enterprises as much, but I talk to my, my readers and it's just become harder and harder to explain indeed what OpenStack is. It was really early on, it was easy to say, yeah, it's your private AWS, it's easy. Once you start talking about integration engines and everything else around it, that's not that, it's somewhat ill-defined. It just, it's become a lot harder for me to tell those stories and you probably have the same problem, but um, so that's, that's my answer to the question nobody asked. It's like answering the question, what is big data? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all for your questions, and let's give a round of applause to our panelists for their time.